Hi. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mohamed Moti from the Centre for Hospital and Sorbonne University in Paris, in France. And it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this uh, a new webinar by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. It's 6 p.m. in Paris, 6 p.m. in Marseille, 5 p.m. in London, at noon in New York. And uh, today's topic is really a very timely and hot topic. And this is about allogenic stem cell transplantation for the so-called elderly or uh, old patient. And some of you may remember that in the 90s, the median age for allogenic stem cell transplantation in the registry was around 37 years. 10 years later, in the early 2000s, it was around 43, 44. Then around the year 2010, actually it moved around 50. Later on, we reached 56, 57. And more recently, actually it went beyond 60. Uh, and now we have many reports in the literature uh, describing the use of allo in a safe and effective manner in patients who are above age 70. And there are many cases in the registry and in our experience even age above 75. So you can see it's a very, very hot topic and with an aging, I would say, worldwide population. And while allotransplant remains the only curative treatment option for many uh, diseases, especially mild malignancies, uh, definitely uh, we need to work on this. And today's speaker is really uh, a top expert in this field. Uh, this is Professor Didier Blaise from the uh, Pauli Calmet Institute in Marseille, who dedicated his whole career in the last uh, 35 or 40 years or so to uh, actually the development of uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation. And to make a long story short, it is about making allotransplant available and safe and effective to all those patients who are in need. That was always his philosophy, and I'm very uh, grateful for his mentorship. So, uh, Didier, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and you will uh, deliver your webinar, and then we'll have a live uh, Q&A. So please, guys, don't hesitate to post your questions, to send your comments, and I'll be more than happy to share this with Professor Blaise after the webinar and have a, a nice discussion. So Didier, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Didier Blaise. I work in Institut Pauli Calmet in Marseille. And I am very pleased to be today with you to discuss the issue of allogenic transplantation in older uh, patients. I have uh, no uh, disclosure to, to say concerning uh, uh, my talk of today. So the first question for this topic we should ask ourselves is why considering allogenic transplantation is in older patients? And in fact, the answer for me is quite simple. We do have to consider it because we need it. The treatment of hematological malignancies in older patients, unfortunately, is still uh, uh, very bad, very poor. Uh, most invasive cancers, as you know, occur in the uh, older age. Uh, in this very interesting paper some years ago already, there was a, tri uh, uh, a, tra a trial to uh, have an evaluation of what will be the number of cancer in the US according to the growth of the normal population. And as you can see, the growth of cancer diagnosis increased much 
quicker than the, uh, uh, the population. And it is due to uh, the uh, older patient, as you can see here, and uh, really the contribution of patient with the age of uh, 65 contributed much more to uh, the growth of number of cancer. It was only a, a prospective evaluation. Now, uh, uh, if you look to the real fact from the SEER, uh, from the NIH, you can see that uh, from the period of time between 2011 and 2015, uh, the number of patients with uh, an age above 70, uh, 55, uh, uh, suffering from AML was 70% with a median age of this patient of 66. Now, if you move to the next period, 2015, 2016, 17, indeed, uh, the uh, age increased and the proportion of patient also increased. So that is the reality. Um, now, what is the reality of treatment in the uh, patient uh, with an older age? When you look to for example, for the patient with uh, 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 older, for older patients with acute myeloid leukemia, and you look to big data, it is surprising to see that many of these patients do not receive any treatment. And it's not only a question of time, of time period. You can see that in the period of 2000, in the year 2000, the proportion was for sure a little bit uh, uh, bigger uh, here than in the recent period of 2009, but the difference is not really clear cut. So it was 10 years ago, things that may have changed, but it's still something important to keep in mind. And if we, you look to the uh, uh, data of this patient, uh, you can see that in fact, of course, patient with an age above 80 is a very old patient, uh, are less treated than the other one. But nevertheless, the one with an age between 60C and 75, who could benefit from intensive treatment, even if you adapt to this intensive treatment, uh, are still uh, not sufficiently treated. And it's a pity because when you look to the outcome of these uh, patients, when they receive an intensive treatment, it's not only allogenic transplantation, uh, the outcome is much better. Of course, many biases in uh, this kind of evaluation, patients with very progressive disease are uh, uh, really in the non-treated group, but nevertheless, it gives a good indication that we should try to treat uh, the patient. So uh, what are the results of allogenic, uh, of patient, older patient who do not receive allogenic uh, transplantation with this kind of uh, disease? This interesting report from the CLGB on more than 2,500 patient look to the outcome of patient, including in the clinical trial, but not able to receive allogenic transplantation, whatever the reason, including the fact that they will not refer to receive the, the treatment. And when you, you look to the outcome of this patient, uh, once again, uh, the outcome of the older patient is very small uh, at, for, at 10 years, uh, under 3%. So once again, biases uh, uh, on this aspect, but interesting to keep these kind of uh, figures into uh, in mind. For myelodysplastic syndrome, it is basically the same. Myelodysplastic syndrome is really a disease of older patients, as you can see here, and the older patients are doing worse than the uh, youngest one. Uh, uh, and notably, if you look to the range of patients above the age of 70 and look to the outcome of this patient receiving azacitidine or decitabine, so hypomethylating uh, agent, you can see that uh, the outcome is very poor uh, with no more than 4% survival at five years. And some of these patients, notably the, the group between 70 and 74, could benefit for more intense treatment. Now, what is the reality of allogenic transplantation in uh, older uh, age? First, the de designation of older age has evolved uh, over time. What was an uh, uh, old patient? In fact, I was uh, I present to you uh, some papers we reported in Marseille uh, uh, in the uh, 90s, as you can see, started in 1987 up to 2000, different prospective clinical trials. And I just want to make the point that at, the, at this time, median age of the patient ranged from 30 to 37. And indeed, 
In this report from the EBMT in 1997, analyzing the patient treated before uh, 1994, uh, they looked to the question of utility or futility of allogenic transplantation in older patients. And uh, the definition of older patient was a patient with an age above 40. And it's very intriguing because when they look to the registry, uh, the European registry, you can see that they found only 151 patients with the CR1 AML and an age above 40 as compared to uh, the other patient. And when uh, you look to the transplant related mortality is really high. So the reality in the early days was this one. We didn't treat all the patients, at least with the definition we have uh, now. In fact, uh, allogenic transplantation is uh, already an old lady. It started uh, in 1957, but the first transplantation performed by Don Thomas uh, in the same time in uh, um, uh, in uh, Paul Bruce, uh, Georges Maté developed the concept of adoptive immunotherapy and acute leukemia. Don Thomas got the Nobel Prize for his work in 1990. And the first allogenic transplantation from a match HLA uh, uh, related donor was reported by, by uh, Dean Buckner for the uh, Seattle group in 1971. Uh, and now we have evolved over time and we have taken into account and uh, the knowledge that we have accumulated over time. And now immunotherapy as developed by uh, uh, Georges Maté is more pregnant and more important in our daily practice going to the development, for example, of CAR T cells. Over time, there have been many changes in the transplantation since the early beginning of this uh, uh, journey. So I didn't list everything. I took some, like, some of them that I thought uh, relevant uh, for the purpose of today, and notably the reduction and the intensity of the conditioning regimen, and also the possibility to do transplantation from an allo, from an haplo uh, donor. And when you look to this uh, evolution over time and look to the activity in my center, you can see that the increase in activity was really, seemed to be really associated, uh, following uh, rather uh, the introduction of these uh, two uh, parameters. And in fact, if you look to the age of the patient, and this is a blue curve, it's the median age of the patient we have transplanted years after years. You can see that, as I say, in the early days, it was under 30. And now we are rather uh, above 60. Uh, uh, and every decade needed 10 years to, uh, uh, to, to, be, uh, to get the patient with uh, 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 10 more years, sorry. Um, now, the reality of our transplantation is what you can see on this uh, uh, slide. Uh, 70, um, uh, only 60% uh, 60, 60 of the patient have an age above 55, and we have a large proportion of patients with an age above uh, 70. There have been other changes over years due to the parameters and the change I, in practice that I have shown, uh, I've shown to you. First one has been the, the fact that we are using different donors. Uh, you can see that over a 15 uh, uh, year period, uh, we decrease the, the proportion of patients receiving a transplantation from match sibling donor, but we increase uh, the, uh, the proportion of patients treated with a haplo transplant. So at the present time, 75% of the patients do not receive a transplantation from match sibling donor. That is very uh, important. And it has been crucial for the older patient because we have very few match sibling donors for this uh, population. Second thing is uh, population and the diagnosis. Uh, as I've shown to you uh, uh, already, the patient with myelodysplastic syndrome uh, are really more uh, treated at the present time. It's a disease of older patient. And if you look to uh, what we have done in terms of activity during this period of time, very clearly, we treat only older patients. It's a vast majority uh, of the patients we treat by period uh, of time, and very few under the age of uh, 60. Now, over years, we got some experience uh, 
for the treatment of patients above the age of 60. And in fact, over a 10 year, a 20 year period, we treated uh, more than 700 patients. As you can see here, and if we divide this database in period of five years, uh, we have uh, uh, very few patients in the first period. And now we are treated more regularly this kind of patient. The median age of this population uh, above the age of 60 increased from 63 to 67, four years, it's a lot. Uh, most of the patients, as I say initially, were treated, uh, uh, all the patients were treated for, from a match-related donor, and now it's only like 10%, as, uh, with 90% uh, from another kind of donor. Most of the patients received reduced intensity conditioning regimen, non myeloablative or really reduced intensity conditioning regimen. And what is the outcome of this patient? It's not so bad. Uh, at 10 years, as you can see here, the overall survival is around uh, uh, 50%. Um, there is a change. I come back again to this point that, for example, the proportion of patients with acute leukemia didn't change, but the number of patients increased because the number uh, of patient responses are really increased. And but the uh, uh, proportion of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome increased really a lot, giving a large number of these patients to be transplanted at the present time. And basically, uh, nearly 90% of the patients we transplant suffer from myeloid malignancies. If I come back to the uh, survival, there was no difference in terms of uh, age for the patient before, uh, above or under 65. And if you look to the outcome in terms of period of time, of course, uh, if we put on the side the very early period of there was the really the learning curve, you can see that there was no difference uh, in terms of overall survival for the three or the uh, period. Does it mean that we have not done any progresses? No. Keep in mind that the population has changed. Older patient, patient treated from haplodonor and more aggressive uh, disease. So clearly, we are daily, we are progressive there. We are pro we make progress day after day. What is the first uh, the, uh, failure, the cause of failure for transplant? The first one is a transplant which is not uh, performed. Uh, Marie Robin looked uh, uh, some years ago uh, to the outcome of uh, patient. We have an indication of allogenic transplantation according to the criteria and the severity of the MDS. All these patients uh, were above the age of 50, median age uh, 60, and they received uh, HLA. They were, uh, they were, uh, the, the donor selected was either a match related donor or unrelated uh, donor. If you look to the outcome of this patient, as you can see here, um, uh, the majority, there is a higher proportion of patients alive after transplantation uh, as compared to the one uh, alive without transplantation. But my point is not this one. My point is the fact that if you look to the transplantation rate, it's rather low. Overall, all these patients have an indication of treatment by allogenic transplantation, unless 69% of them receive the transplantation. And if you look to the one really who have an eligible donor, it's only also 70%. So clearly, 30% of the patients did not receive the treatment they should have received. Renier de Villiers in Marseille for the Philo group also makes the same kind of analysis for a patient with AML. But in this analysis, there were some patients with haplotransplant. All these patients receive intensive chemotherapy and have an indication of allergenic transplantation. And you can see, according to different periods of time, 10 year period, that uh, only 46% of the patient. Uh, in the last period uh, have an allogenic transplantation. It's much better than in the early period, but nearly it's still not uh, uh, more than half of the patient. And if you look to the reason not to be transplanted, it's still a quarter of them due to the fact that the patient had not recurred. So really something we have to change is probably to put more patient in the uh, uh, transplant tunnel and probably to solve the problem of restriction to this treatment uh, that have been felt by many investigators. So the reason not to carry out a transplantation in older patients uh, are many. Some are probably due to outdated perception of transplantation. Many people think always to, always to the transplantation in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, earlier uh, earlier days uh, so transplantation is too toxic it's not efficient and if you survive to transplantation you have a poor quality of life and there were also some good sometimes or bad or incomplete technical arguments and i will review that uh, for you for example the absence of suitable donor it was true when we were doing transplantation only from match a sibling donor it's not anymore true uh, also the problem of high risk disease that need Transplantation after an intensive conditioning regimen is not adapted to, to uh, older patients. And it is completely true. The problem is, the, the, the answer to this question, and I will come back to that, is that you have perhaps to change the practice of uh, allogenic transplantation. So first thing, is allogenic transplantation efficient in uh, older patients? Uh, Renier de Villiers, once again, for the philo group, uh, makes this interesting analysis. It's a time-dependent analysis in order to avoid biases, uh, meaning that, in fact, uh, all the patients are taken at the time of CR1, and they, uh, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they try to go to transplantation, but of course, you can have uh, a problem before with non-relapse mortality of relapse before going to transplantation, and after uh, there is the outcome of this patient uh, taking into account the events as a relapse or non-relapse mortality. When you look to the outcome uh, of these patients, the one who receive allogenic transplantation are doing much better than the uh, other one. Another way to see that is to have this kind of modeling, uh, multi-state modeling, or you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, the patient uh, uh, who are uh, uh, in CR, uh, after allogenic transplantation and long-term survival are much more numerous than the one who didn't get, receive uh, uh, allogenic transplantation. And the main cause of failure in this situation is obviously relapse. Many um, retrospective analyses have been performed uh, considering uh, this point. Is allogenic transplantation something important in uh, uh, older patients? And all these analyses that have been reviewed uh, two years ago by Richard Lynn and Andrew Arts have shown some benefit uh, to perform allogenic transplantation. But once again, it's uh, a retrospective uh, analysis. There are, in fact, very few prospective analyses in this uh, uh, situation. Nicholas Krager uh, reported this uh, prospective study concerning uh, myelodysplastic syndrome patient, uh, median age around 65, as you can see uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, when you look to the outcome uh, of the patient on the long term, you can see that there is a benefit uh, for the one where received allogenic transplantation. And when you look so to this uh, forest plot, you can see that it is true, notably, for the patient with an age above 65, meaning that this patient can really benefit from this kind of approach. Another study uh, concerning also uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome with uh, uh, also uh, the patient uh, who are biologically uh, assigned to transplantation as in the previous uh, study. In the previous study, it was after uh, four circles, uh, uh, courses of azacitidine. Here it's not, uh, it was uh, open, but you can see here that if you perform allogenic transplantation in the situation of what we call donor arm, median age 66, uh, uh, sorry, the outcome, it's much in favor of the one who receive allogenic transplantation with a, a huge benefit in this situation. So it is very interesting to see that at least for this kind uh, of disease and myelodysplastic syndrome, there is an advantage. Um, at last ASH meeting, there was the report of these all the studies that have not yet been published by Dieter Lidovizer. It's a randomization of patients with biological randomization of the patient with an age above 60, uh, suffering for AML and uh, uh, getting uh, CR1. As you can see here, clearly there is a very different outcome in terms of relapse rate for the one who received allogenic transplantation. And uh, um, uh, and there is uh, uh, much more uh, non-relapse mortality uh, in this uh, group also. But at the end of the day, the outcome is much better in this situation of a patient receiving allogenic transplantation with uh, five years, 30% uh, outcome for this patient 
above the age of 60. It's not to say that we solve everything and that 30% survival is good. It's not enough, but it's much better than uh, less than 10%. A uh, very recent paper uh, reported by uh, uh, Mohamed Soror uh, uh, in January this year looked to what they call an eight year pragmatic observation evaluation of the benefit of allogenic transplantation in older patients. It was, in fact, a prospective study in 13 centers with nearly 700 patients, 46% of them being uh, transplanted. When they looked to the outcome of the one, who get the transplantation and the one who didn't get the transplantation, there was much uh, many parameters in favor of uh, allogenic transplantation. In fact, after adjustment to the cytogenetic, to the risk of the, pay, of the disease, to the comorbidity, these advantage disappeared. And the conclusion of the paper was in fact two. The first one was that there is no benefit to perform allogenic transplantation in older patients and medically infirm patients. And the second one is uh, we need prospective trial. I fully agree with the second uh, uh, statement. I am not a, I'm totally disagreeing with the first one. Why? Because in fact, the population of older patients and medically infirm patients is not the same. And we cannot do exactly the same thing. And if you look to that, the, uh, to the, the, the characteristic of this patient uh, is uh, rather uh, to see that 43% uh, of the patients have an age above uh, under uh, 60. Uh, also, the comorbidity score is very high for many of these patients. 60% have a comorbidity score of four, uh, uh, four or above. And 44% of the patients are uh, uh, complete CR. So if the message is to say that if you take the population in the bulk, of course, with very poor uh, uh, prognosis patient, the result will, will not be good. I think this paper is the really the illustration of what is important. You have to select the patient to give very good result. Our uh, purpose will not be to give all the patient the, uh, the good way of allogenic transplantation. I would love to do that, but uh, to be very pragmatic that we say we know that not all of the patients will benefit from that. And it is the purpose of my talk today that the selection and the personalization of treatment is very, very important. So over to all these results, there are, me, there are many conflicting results between studies and trials because the conditioning are not the same, because the population are not the same, because the follow-up uh, is not the same. And the transplantation has grown in complexity. Uh, and I'm sure that in your uh, program, uh, the, your problem is to take decision day after day, uh, patient after patient. And you have many possibilities uh, to, to use, either on the conditioning regimen, to, you to have to choose the donor, you have to choose the graft, the GVHD prophylaxis, and uh, perhaps to decide uh, on treatment after transplantation. So clearly, we have to compare things that uh, have to be compared, but on overall, it's difficult to take information, notably from the registry data. And I totally agree with what has been one of the statements of the previous study showing that we need absolutely a clinical trial. Now, I will try to address some questions concerning uh, uh, the treatment of patients with allogenic transplantation when they have an older age. What is the importance of conditioning? Uh, you remember, that after the seminal uh, publication from Ernst Oller in 1990, showing that the toxicity of transplantation was related to the yellow ablation uh, of the conditioning regimen, uh, uh, growing, going to uh, uh, really uh, the cytokine storm uh, uh, and due to the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. Uh, we have developed, and many people have developed, a uh, new approach with the uh, 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 what is called now the uh, uh, reduced intensity conditioning regimen. But you can have a variation in the intensity of conditioning regimen. And the idea of this conditioning regimen, and it was uh, difficult in the early days because it was a dogma that we needed a yellow ablative regimen. Uh, uh, the, the idea and the goal was to decrease the initial uh, 100 day toxicity. And we came from what we were performing in the uh, early days 
one conditioning will fit all situation to the statement that in fact one size cannot fit all situation. There have been not so many uh, um, report concerning prospective report concerning uh, allogenic transplantation and the intensity of the conditioning regimen and most of them uh, many of them have been performed in uh, rather young patients and it's normal because if you want to do yellow ablative regimen you have to have a young uh, patient but despite that there have been differences in terms of non relapse mortality and in terms of relapse in the different uh, uh, studies in fact, we try to address this question in older patients uh, by setting up uh, um, uh, different trials concerning the use of reduced intensity uh, conditioning regimen. One of our first trials was to introduce reduced intensity conditioning regimen in uh, older patients uh, based on a combination of fludarabin, two days of IV busulfan, and two days of ETG. And the patient have an age above 55, as you can see here, the early initial mortality was very low at 1%, and the grade 3 to 4 QGVHD was also uh, very low. When you look to the outcome of this patient, you can see that at five years, we are a uh, uh, survival of uh, above uh, 60, uh, around 60%, which is very uh, interesting. We have still a lot of relapse, and the major cause of relapse is not anymore non-relapse mortality, but uh, uh, relapse. Remember, this has been reported in 2015. It was patient we have treated uh, two or three years uh, before at the time that many of the things we are doing now were not really available. And as you can see here, the main cause of mortality was related to relapse. So it has been a real change over years that the main problem of halogenic transplantation, even in older patients, is uh, the disease control. What is interesting in this paper is the fact that we analyze also the quality of life. Because uh, to have a survival is very important, but to have a good quality of life for this uh, surviving patient is already very important. So when we look to the quality of life in auto questionnaires uh, done by the patient, uh, three quarters of the patient, one year after transplantation, uh, feel that they have a better or equal quality of life, whatever the, par the parameter you look at uh, uh, as compared to the situation prior to transplantation. So not non only we can have, so we can cure patients, but we can cure patients uh, giving them a, a good quality of life. So the dose intensity of the conditioning regimen uh, is important. Uh, we try to address uh, once again uh, this uh, question by a prospective randomized uh, trial that have been reported by Renier uh, at the last ASH meeting, where we uh, uh, compare the outcome of a patient above the age uh, of 55 between three uh, uh, arms. They are receiving exactly the same conditioning regimen, except for the uh, number of days of busulfan. The control arm was the one I have just described to you, and we went to three days and four days, and they were scheduled to receive uh, a match uh, HLA uh, transplant. Uh, it was on less here ML of myelodysplastic syndrome, and it was, as I said, patient above the age uh, of uh, 60 uh, or from six, 50 to 60 if they have some uh, clinical problem. Now, when you look to uh, the outcome of this patient, very clearly, the non-relapse mortality uh, was too much high uh, in the situation of four days, and we have to stop this uh, arm, as you can see here. In terms of overall survival, it's clear that there is uh, a better advantage for the patient who received the BX2 uh, arm. And that's something very important, because I, initially, uh, we do feel that, uh, in fact, uh, we will we be much better, at least with the BX4, BX3 and probably BX4 in this situation of patient, but it is not the case. The other information is that the relapse rate is not increased really when we decrease the intensity of the conditioning regimen. There have been other studies uh, asking the same question. The Figaro trial uh, uh, reported by uh, Charlie Craddock. Uh, two years ago. As you can see here, there is really no difference uh, according to the intensity of the conditioning regimen or uh, 
once again, this is a study uh, reported uh, by Renier uh, de Villiers, uh, considering uh, TBF free compared to non myeloablative regimen, as you can see, the outcome uh, is uh, uh, the, the same. So, does it mean that uh, those intensity have no, no impact? That's not the case. We know very well that there is an importance of dose intensity in the control of the disease. This has been demonstrated by Redgecliffe in a TBI regimen uh, trial, and we reported that uh, uh, many years ago or so uh, with uh, uh, comparing uh, fludarabibusulfan ATG with free TBI regimen. But pro uh, the problem is that there are other parameters and uh, we may play in other parameters and perhaps the intensity of the conditioning regimen is not the uh, appropriate answer to the difficulty of treating uh, the disease. And we can do something different, notably by introducing treatment after transplantation. So it is one of the questions we must ask, is really treatment after transplantation able to overcome the impact of lowering the intensity of the conditioning regimen? I have not yet the answer. Many studies are uh, still ongoing. It's not easy, notably in older patients. For example, if you use azacitidine after transplantation, it can be very toxic. So we have to be innovative. It's a kind of regimen we can use. And we are performing in France now a prospective trial, uh, what we call the elite trial, where the patients are randomized on day 60 after transplantation to receive or not to receive a prophylactic DLI because immunotherapy can be one of the answer to control, to give a better disease control. So one of the aspects of my talk today and my purpose is really to show to you that we have to be innovative in the way we do uh, allogenic transplantation. Second question, which is of importance and related to the first one of the intensity of the conditioning regimen. What to do for a patient who have still a stigma of disease and notably uh, 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 minimal, uh, measurable residual disease. Uh, this paper from Hurrigan some years ago already show very uh, interesting data, uh, showing that in fact, uh, when you look to the patient with a positive MRB, uh, there is an importance of the intensity of the conditioning regimen. When the MRD is not uh, uh, is negative, uh, the conditioning regimen have no importance. And now when you look to the outcome, the blue line are the one with, uh, who received myeloablative regimen, either uh, with positive or negative MRD, and you see no difference. And there is a huge difference for the one who received reduced intensity conditioning regimen uh, uh, with RIC, uh, reduced intensity conditioning regimen with positive MRD as compared to the one with uh, uh, negative MRD. And in terms of outcome, uh, the curve are this one. Well, what does it mean? The simple, say, simple way to say is to say, oh, uh, if a patient has a, a positive MRD uh, and we want to do, and it's an older patient, so we cannot give uh, 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 intense, intensity, uh, intense treatment, you should not transplant it. But if you look to the outcome of this patient, you can see that uh, the outcome of this patient is not zero, it's above 40%, which is not so bad. Of course, it's not enough, and we have to to figure out what to do in this situation. But it's something important. So clearly, should positive MRD contraindicate the transplant? And, uh, and you basically, we have to uh, go to palliative care. Remember that the outcome of the patient not transplanted is very small. The other alternative would say, OK, we will delay the transplant. We will give more treatment, and uh, uh, we will try to get a positive MRD. I'm not sure it's a good strategy, because doing that, you will uh, uh, really increase the risk of toxicity after transplantation and the risk uh, of never do performing the transplant uh, is real. So we have to find other tool to, to make a decision. Uh, recently, this paper uh, uh, was very intriguing. In fact, it was an analysis of, of parameters uh, trying to define what would be the possibility to predict the outcome of patient on disease uh, parameter, but also uh, on patient parameter. And in this situation, it was a, a comorbidity uh, score. So associated with other uh, uh, possibilities. As you can see, uh, they, the, the authors 
uh, after this COX, uh, made a different pronostic group according to the score assigned in the uh, statistical analysis. And you can see that they are able to predict uh, the outcome of patient in terms of disease-free survival or relapse survival. And this is very important because all these parameters, we have basically them at the time of uh, diagnosis. So we can prepare the thing. It means that for the patient with very high risk, being in the very high risk group, perhaps you have to change the initial strategy and not give only the standard uh, one. And now, if you try to mix that with the MRD, you can see the MRD is not any more predictive on any outcome, whatever the risk group you consider. And I think this kind of uh, 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 is, uh, this kind of information are really uh, very uh, important. Now, what about the donor? Many, many uh, re retrospective trials have been conducted, uh, mixing older and uh, younger uh, patients. That is, of course, of importance, but it's difficult to have a, a, a clear uh, uh, idea. Um, this report from uh, uh, Greenwald some years ago for uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome in older patients, only uh, older patients, is important, uh, showing that uh, for the median age of 65 to 68, uh, uh, the outcome of patient, the overall survival of the two group, match unrelated donor or unrelated or haplo transplant, is exactly the same. However, in terms of relapse, there is an advantage, advantage for unrelated donor transplant, uh, and it's true also for disease-free survival. But it's a retrospective study. And when you look to the uh, characteristic of the population, you can see that the patients who are receiving haplo transplant are, are really at higher risk than the other one, and they receive a less intense treatment. So this retrospective study is uh, very difficult to, uh, to be interpreted. Uh, in France, we decided to address this question prospectively, and we uh, set up a prospective uh, uh, trial uh, where uh, we uh, wonder uh, what will be the outcome of the patient in a search strategy for haplo or unrelated transplant. We randomized 77 patients. They received, uh, uh, they were designed to receive. Uh, the standard of conditioning regimen for MUD, which is the one I have already described. And for the haplo uh, situation, they receive the Tayotepa Fridarabilisufan PTCY, which was our, uh, also our standard at this time. And they receive PTCY because at this time, uh, PTCY was not the reference for HLA match uh, trans transplant. And it was in the situation where not much sibling donor was available. At the end of the day, and I will not go through all the details, you can see here that the outcome of the patient will receive haplo transplant or unrelated transplant uh, uh, are exactly uh, the same. So the conclusion of that is that what is important is not the kind of trans the donor you will have because the result is the same. The importance is to have a donor at the time you need it. Now, if you look to really older patient, uh, the patient above the age of 70 years. I put uh, so here some slide for, from our experience of patient above the age of 70. We receive half flow transplant uh, after non yellow ablative regimen. And for we, we, we have an intent to treat prophylactic uh, a DLI strategy. So they receive this conditioning regimen. Uh, you can see that this patient re, we are treated for AML or myelodysplastic uh, syndrome, 40% with myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. 50% uh, have a comorbidity score above uh, of three or above three. When you look to the outcome of this patient, remember they are older than 70 years, the initial non-relapse mortality is uh, really rather, uh, rather low. And the outcome of this patient is rather good. Uh, Cost is not 100%, but overall survival of 69% for MDS or 63% for uh, uh, AML is not uh, this bad. And on the top of that, if you look to the one who are surviving, uh, you can see here that less than 15% of the patient are really suffering from long-term GVHD, and most of the patient did not receive any uh, immunosuppression after six months. Six months. 
So really, the situation of allergen transplantation is of the patient are really challenged. So I would say there is no real place for standard allogenic transplantation is what I try to, to, uh, to convince you. We are really to adapt the, the treatment to the population and we have to learn how to do that. Many parameters are important, the conditioning regimen, the donor, the GVHD prophylaxis, and the transplantation doesn't stop at the time we infuse the graft. What we can do afterward is very important and can consolidate what we want to do. I will end my talk by developing something which is very important. The population of older patients is not the same one than the, uh, 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 the youngest one. Really, transplantation, uh, it's uh, really uh, uh, a form of accelerated, a model of accelerated aging. Uh, this aging, you can consider uh, that at the level of the cell. It's what we call general science. Or at the time of organ, or organ is what we look at when we look to the uh, late effects or overall on the organism and what we call the uh, phenotypic uh, aging. And that's uh, very important to keep uh, in mind. How to assess the situation and the physiology of these uh, older patients? Many things, many uh, scores have been developed, either on the physical function, uh, ERLDL, for example, they will show that it had been shown that it will decrease the overall survival. Many other parameters, the cognition, the mental health, the polypharmacy, uh, and the nutrition, which is very uh, important. So many parameters can be important and uh, used uh, in this situation. And they are really predictive. If you look to the cognition, clearly, uh, when you have a, a, a worse uh, uh, BOMC, uh, I will not go through the, the detail. The, uh, uh, the outcome and the toxicity is much higher. It's true for physical function. It's true for nutrition. It's true for polypharmacy. And it's true also for the social vulnerability of the patient. Is the patient alone? Is it really supported by the family or friend? May make a real difference at the end of the day. So we have to take into account this parallel. There are, however, real bias to geriatric uh, assessment in the older patient. And in this paper from uh, Mishra, uh, they try to list these uh, kind of uh, uh, difficulties. First, what tools to use? Is one predictive of everything? Obviously, it is not the case. And you can see here that 70% uh, of the doctors who have been uh, uh, interviewed didn't know uh, what to do. <clears throat> they deplore the lack of training and knowledge about this kind of evaluation and the lack of clinical support staff. Really, if you want to do a very good geriatric evaluation, it will take uh, at least 90 minutes. And we have no time to do that. So how to solve this kind of question? Because we don't need only one parameter. We need really to have a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Alors, why do we need that? First thing is that uh, we have to balance the toxicity uh, uh, of the treatment according to the benefit or to the harm uh, we may get from the treatment. And it is not exactly the same in uh, young and uh, older uh, patients. So is it the contraindication to transplantation? It may be the case, but there is another way to do. And probably the other way is, can we take into account these parameters and change the reality of the uh, patient by an intervention? I will just give you uh, some example. If you, the patient are really many medications, we will interfere with the treatment we give in transplantation. We may decrease uh, some of this medication. If the patient yeah, is really uh, uh, has a sarcopenia, may we try to increase the uh, fitness of this patient in this situation. If the patient is not really uh, has a physical activity, perhaps we can do uh, something on this aspect. And there is an importance of that because in this recent paper, when you look to the outcome of patients, we have received an intervention prior to transplantation uh, based on the geriatric assessment, but the outcome of this patient is better not at, notably in terms of non-relapse mortality. So we have to change our way to practice and to try to find out what is possible uh, to do uh, for this patient. So in conclusion, I will say, Transplantation for older patients is really real, if the strategy is really adapted. Uh, 
there is a learning curve and we have to, to, to learn uh, these parameters. Uh, patients have really specificities. La frailty is something important and she, this frailty must be individually characterized by geriatric assessment. Uh, patients have more comorbidities, have more underestimated organ damage and the resilience of this patient is not exactly uh, the same. Disease control is real, but we have still to improve that and probably by doing and uh, giving treatment after transplantation. What else, how to progress? Uh, first, we have to systematically use existing tools, uh, able to characterize every individual patient. Second, we have to combine the different tools and we have to set up in our own clinic what is possible and how we can do that. Some of these tests will not take more than a few minutes but we have to select them and try to, to uh, figure out for our patient what we, we can do. On the top of that, and it will be my conclusion, uh, we have for years only looked at the stresses of transplantation, the disease itself or the transplant with all the parameters of transplant. We have to consider that transplantation is not only these two parameters. First, there is the patient himself. We have to, to see what is the physiologic aging of this patient, but also what, is, what are his, his motivation, which is very important in the decision to do transplantation and to go in this difficult journey. But also the ecosystem, what are the caregivers around that, what are the possibility of support they can get, which are very important. And in fact, the decision of transplantation and the way we will conduct and carry out the transplantation will be based on these uh, different parameters. So on these uh, uh, different points, and I just forgot that to say, we have to promote uh, clinical and drug intervention prior to transplantation. And something important I forgot to say, that this intervention doesn't, does not stop with the transplantation. We have to really to conduct uh, intervention after transplantation in terms of nutrition, in terms of physical activity, which is very uh, important. So uh, it's really the situation of personalized medicine. And I think it's very exciting to be in uh, this field at the present time. So I would like to finish by thanking all the people uh, I have the, uh, the, the luck to work with in, uh, in Marseille, and notably René de Villiers, who performed many of these analyses, the one uh, in the leukemia unit, uh, who are very important in for what we do, and of course, uh, the people with whom I work now, uh, the management sport cancer, where we try to develop uh, uh, help to the patient uh, after uh, transplantation, and of course, our collaborators all over uh, the world. If you are interested by this subject, I uh, just uh, remember that we are setting up a pros uh, uh, next symposium in Marseille from June 23 to 25 this year. We will be uh, devoted in all the patients with QOL uh, in this field, and it will be of a great intensity. Thank you for your attention, and I will be pleased to answer the question you want to, to ask me, even by mail. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Didier, for really uh, beautiful and uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, I hope everybody has enjoyed it and we have already a lot of questions. So first question is a pragmatic question and I'm reading, uh, well, apparently you convinced everybody that we should look into the physiological age, but from a practical point of view today, do you look or do you restrict access to an age? If you have a 79-year-old patient coming to you, would you still look to the physiological age and comorbidities and do whatever assessment? Or you would say, anyway, uh, that's a little bit pushing a lot. No, we have no real limitation in terms of age. The chronologic age is not the good parameter. We rather good to the as we I try to develop the real physiologic age and the physiologic aging, which is very very important. And of course, all the other parameters of our importance. Uh, what are the real motivation of the patient? Because, as you know, transplant is a long journey. 
And we have to be sure that the patient will be uh, will agree all over these months to 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 be on this journey. So it's very very important in this situation. Okay, thank you very much. But since you are speaking about uh, the transplant journey, actually, although the incidence of complications has decreased, we still face some complications. And we have a question here about these elderly fit patient who went through transplant, but unfortunately uh, developed acute GVHD and received the steroids, especially for the severe acute GVHD. And then you can see these patient actually going, flipping into the other side. And uh, because they don't have enough physiological reserve actually uh, to go through the complication while initially they were deemed to be fit. So how can you anticipate or how do you manage this situation? That's a major point because we know very well that there will be complications for many of these patients. And I have not the answer to exactly, to say exactly what we have to do. What I can say is that um, we have to be innovative. I use these words several times in my talk because I do think that's very important. Standard transplantation and standard uh, uh, care of the patient is not the good way to do uh, to do transplantation in this patient. And for example, taking um, the example of a cure GVHD, there is now very nice algorithm uh, when you treat the patient with corticosteroid, and if it's not working. Uh, you use the second line with a new medication available. And after you go to the third line, it will not work in all the patients because they will die before from the complication of the GVHD or complication of the treatment. So we have really to find a way to decrease the incidence of, the, uh, of GVHD by better GVHD prophylaxis. We have PTCY, we have ATG, why not mixing that? It's maybe of importance, and to be very more aggressive in the good way, not on the toxic way, but more aggressive initially on, even if we have not all the data uh, to promote this kind of uh, approach at the present time. Excellent, thank you uh, very much, uh, Didier. So we have now a question about the uh, optimal choice of the donor for an elderly patient. So assuming you have the choice between, uh, obviously uh, it's unlikely that we will have the parents for an elderly patient as a donor. So assuming you have a choice between the children, which are supposed to be relatively young uh, and a young unrelated donor, but also a mad sibling, elderly mad sibling, because usually there are two to three years difference between, uh, in general, the siblings, although it can change, it can be different. But so if you have these three options, where would you go? Um, is there an algorithm? I know there is no validated or 100% answer, but today, if you have such patient, what would be your choice? Um, the safe answer will be, at the present time at least, will, will be probably to say, um, if you have a match sibling donor, you may use the match sibling donor. But I say at the present time, because I am not sure it will be the truth in the coming uh, years, because uh, the age of the patient, we have now many, many data, the age of the donor is seems to be very uh, crucial in terms of outcome. Now, when you compare the haplo and unrelated, uh, we have, as you know, Mohammed, we have performed this uh, study in France showing that uh, at the end of the day, whatever the donor, you have the same outcome. However, I didn't show many uh, uh, data on this uh, study. There are something important. And I think one of the things I have learned from this study is the fact that if you decide in front that you would prefer to have a haplo donor, or you decide you will prefer to have an unrelated donor, and you didn't find them, you will lose much time. And it is very important to be very open at the beginning, say, what is important is to have a donor, whatever is a donor. 
So in another word, you would rather immediately take whoever donor is immediately available. Okay, wonderful. And uh, actually that goes in line with one comment we have, and I think we can have a quick answer to Dr. Jose Luis Lopez Lorenzo about the use of uh, uh, maintenance therapy after transplant for these patients. I guess your answer is gonna be yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, with, with adaptation, because it may be tricky to give some drug to these patients. Drug interactions, I fully agree with you. And this is more and more where we are relying a lot on our pharmacists to uh, uh, dig a little bit deeper into all the drugs they are taking because age comes with a few number of uh, drugs being taken routinely. Let's take one question, one last question about uh, uh, the use of post sci and its side effect. And uh, I think Dr. Mike Radford highlighted the issue of uh, cardiac toxicity. And we know that in elderly patients, uh, cardiovascular uh, comorbidities are more frequent than in the general population. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? First, uh, our older patients, uh, all of them have an intensive uh, cardiologic checkup before transplantation. And I think it's very important to know where, uh, where are these patients, uh, really, what are exactly the situation of the patient. We have seen some cardiac toxicities, true, but most of them have been related to the fact that we need to give more flu uh, much fluid to this patient. So we have to monitor uh, this patient in a good way. And for example, for uh, in the early phase of what we have done in all the patients, this patient received the PTCY in the ICU in our institution. So I know that is not uh, possible everywhere, but. At least it was just to have a good monitoring of this patient. And the third kind of answer I can give is also that we decrease the dose of uh, uh, PTCY to this patient coming from 50 milligrams to, to 40 milligrams per day with no difference in terms of GVHD prophylaxis and good outcome. I, I fully agree with you. And for those colleagues who are interested, uh, there is a joint BMT publication between your team and our team uh, on uh, this topic by Duleri and colleagues. I think it's now uh, uh, two minutes past 7 uh, p.m. in Marseille. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Didier, for uh, this really, again, very comprehensive and uh, beautiful analysis of the state of the art when it comes to allotransplant in elderly patient. And I believe uh, while all the fields are progressing at the end of the day also, it's not only about the new drugs and uh, uh, novel cellular therapies, but the old fashioned, I would say, allotransplant continue to progress and uh, uh, remains an effective and safe option. So thank you all for being loyal to the ICH uh, webinars. It has been a pleasure having you with us uh, today, uh, but this is gonna be a busy week because I think tomorrow we will have the first episode of a new initiative by the ICH, which is the ICH for nurses. And we all know how important uh, is the role of uh, our uh, nurses in the management of uh, uh, patients with hematological diseases. And one good example actually was uh, from uh, uh, this webinar today about the transplant in the elderly patient. And actually, you really need to have a dedicated uh, and skilled nursing team because obviously it takes a little bit more time to handle these patients. So tomorrow, guys, you will have the first broadcast of a, a fantastic webinar uh, from the ICH for nurses. So wherever you are, thank you very much for joining and please stay safe and keep well. Cheers. Bye.